All right, so today, and perhaps over the next few sessions, um, we'll see how it goes. I'm utilizing a phenomenal little book by Alexander Strout, Leading with Love. You have this book, Michael? Yeah. Have you read any of it? Have you led, read Strout? He's good. He, he's known for a book, um, Biblical Eldership, I think is what he's probably most known for. But uh, he's an excellent author, and he's a pastor. And I wanted to read... We're looking at principle number seven today. Um, we've gone through principle number one, establish a relationship with the greatest leader. Number two, the character of a true Christian leader. Three, convictions necessary for great leadership. Number four, the necessary convictional intelligence of Christian leadership. The necessary narrative of Christian leadership. The necessary worldview of Christian leadership. We looked at last time, which is about a month and a half ago now. Um, and now I want us to look at the necessary love of a leader. And I say, I don't know how long this will go because you could really just spend a lifetime here, couldn't you? So um, we'll see <clears throat> how long we spend, and especially using Strout. But I wanted to read this story. And this is the opening um, couple pages from Alexander Strout's book. Let me, let me read just a couple pages to you. Dwight Moody, the Billy Graham of the 19th century, tells of his life-changing encounter with the doctrine of love. It began when Henry, Henry Morehouse, a 27-year-old British evangelist, preached at Moody's church for a week. To everyone's surprise, Morehouse preached seven sermons in a row on John 3.16. To prove that God so loved the world, he preached on the love of God from Genesis to Revelation. Moody's son records his father's description of the impact of Morehouse's preaching. And he, this is Moody's son writing now. For six nights he had preached on this one text. The seventh night came and he went into the pulpit. Every eye was upon him. He said, Beloved friends, I have been hunting all day for a new text, but I cannot find anything so good as the old one. So we will go back to the third chapter of John and the 16th verse. And he preached the seventh sermon from those wonderful words, <clears throat> God so loved the world. I remember the end of that sermon. My friends, he said, for a whole week I've been trying to tell you how much God loves you, but I cannot do it with this poor stammering tongue. If I could borrow Jacob's ladder and climb up into heaven and ask Gabriel, who stands in the presence of the Almighty, to tell me how much love the Father has for the world, all he could say would be, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Unable to hold back the tears as Morehouse preached on the love of God in sending his only son to die for sinners, Moody confessed, I never knew up to that time that God loved us so much. This heart of mine began to thaw out. I could not keep back the tears. It was like news from a far country. I just drank it in. So did the crowded congregation. I tell you, there is one thing that draws above everything else in the world, and that is love. As a result, writes Strauch, of Morehouse's influence, Moody began to study the doctrine of love. This changed his life in preaching, and he later said this, I took up that word love, and I do not know how many weeks I spent in studying the passages in which it occurs till at last I could not help loving people. I had been feeding on love so long that I was anxious to do everybody good I came in contact with. I got full of it. It ran out my fingers. You take up the subject of love in the Bible, you will get so full of it that all you have got to do is to open your lips and a flood of the love of God flows out upon the meeting. There is no use trying to do work, church work, without love. A doctor, a lawyer may do good work without love, but God's work cannot be done without love. D.L. Moody could not have been more biblically correct when he said God's work cannot be done without love. That is the message of the most famous love chapter in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 13. So that's the start of his book, and I just thought, man, that's really, that's a good story, right? Um, here, Moody sitting under Morehouse, who for seven days is just preaching on the love of God. From the one text for God so loved the world. Um, and so I wanted us to look at the love of in leadership and the necessary love of leadership. Um, and, and 
yeah, unpack. And we'll follow a bit of Strauch's outline, not in its entirety, but why don't we turn to 1 Corinthians 13? That's where Strauch takes us. And we all know it, right, as the love chapter. Um, probably every wedding we've ever been to, the preacher's probably gotten up and expounded 1 Corinthians 13, right? Um, it's famous. Um, what's often not understood is the context in which Romans or 1 Corinthians 13 comes to us in between 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 14, in the broader context of the church of Corinth, right? Um, and so if you were to read chapter 12, there seems to be some, what's going on here seems to be some despising amongst the church. Some of the arrogant um, are looking down on other Christians in the church because they don't have or exercise certain gifts. And so there's this real spirit of arrogance and the spirit of division cropping up. And Paul reveals, actually, if you look in 1 Corinthians 12, he reveals the nature of the church and the gifts of its members. Look at verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret? So you see what he's saying. Verse 27, you're the body of Christ. You're all one in Christ. And you're members of it in the, in the church. Universal, but the local church. And he says, look, God, and the point isn't to exegete this text, but he's saying God has appointed various gifts in the church. God's done it, right? And so here people are despising others because they're not speaking in tongues, or they're not prophesying, or they don't have miracles, and they're looking down saying, you're a second-class Christian. And he says, wait a second. Has God appointed all to do all the gifts? The emphatic answer implied is no, clearly not, right? And so when you have charismatic churches, I don't know if you guys have some exposure with them, where they say you're not a Christian if you don't speak in tongues. Well, Paul here just flat out denies that. He says, do all speak in tongues? Clearly, no, they don't. And as he ends chapter 12, he is showing the Corinthians there's something more to be desired than just a grand display of supernatural gifting. There's something to be coveted more than tongues, more than <laughs> prophecy. What is it? Look at verse 31. Here's Paul's promise. But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. There is a higher way a more excellent way than coveting another's gifts or despising the lack of supernatural giftedness in members in the church. There's a higher way. And Paul promises, I'm going to show you that higher way. And so enter in. You know, welcome to the stage, 1 Corinthians 13. It helps with the context, and it really buttresses the truth of 1 Corinthians 13. All the more, let's begin reading in verse uh, 1. Actually, let's read all of chapter 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. 
When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in mir a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall f know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now, faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Love. That's the higher way that Paul wants to show the Corinthian church. And Paul, the apostle himself was a man consumed with love, wasn't he? Out of all the New Testament writers, now granted, Paul wrote more than all the New Testament writers except for Luke. Um, I believe Luke actually technically wrote more in the gospel and the account of uh, the Holy Spirit in Acts. But Paul, of all the the apostles and all the New Testament writers, um, wrote more of love. Listen to what Strauch says. No other New Testament writer, writer spoke more about love or provided more practical leadership examples of love than Paul. Through the lifetime ministry and letters of Paul, God gave his church and all of its leaders and teachers a model of loving leadership. So in the midst of a church that was biting and devouring itself, divided over church discipline, producing all sorts of chaos with the supernatural, um, plagued by immorality, confused. There's a lot of confusion in Corinth, wasn't there? Confusion about what the Lord's Supper was, confusion about how we conduct ourselves as Christians. And Paul shows them in the midst of all that, the higher way of love. Um, what kind of love was Paul showing the Corinthians? We're going to get into verse 4 and through 13 in coming weeks, God willing, and we'll see how much time we spend there. So we're just going to focus on verses 1 through 3. But the kind of love that Paul was demonstrating to the Philippians, or I'm sorry, the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 13, is agape love. And according to John MacArthur, agape love is one of the rarest words, I'm sorry, agape, which is love, is one of the rarest words in ancient Greek literature, but one of the most common in the New Testament. I really like that. Um, he, he reveals that if you go through ancient Greek literature, you're not going to find agape. You'll find eros and philo and love, but agape love is rare. But in the New Testament, it's one of the most common words. Um, it's just over and over and over. And in our day, there's a lot of confusion about love, isn't there? Mm -hmm. I said last week in my sermon that we've confused love with lust and kind of interchanged the two. So now you'll hear slogans like love wins or love is love, right? Um, but we've so often confused love with lust. And because of that, we end up denigrating true love and idolizing lust, which renders true love, or in our understanding, it renders true love meaningless. Um, it's, it's lost its flavor. It's lost its definition. <clears throat> Listen to what MacArthur writes this. Many Christians seem to think of love only in terms of nice feelings, warm affection, romance, and desire. When we say, I love you, we often mean, I love me, and I want you. That, of course, is the worst sort of selfishness, the very opposite of agape love. Have you thought about that? I love you because of how you serve me, is really what's being communicated. It's so true, isn't it? And ultimately, for the unbeliever, the person who hasn't been regenerated and brought in a new life with Christ, that's all the love they're capable of. I'm not saying you can't behave selflessly and genuinely have a, a true love for your children. What I'm saying is, ultimately, you're still serving the idol and worshiping the idol of self. So it's all, even your love for others, is being filtered through the worship of self. Even if that self is the idolization of self is demonstrating the idolization of someone else. It all comes down to self. Only the person that has died to self-worship and has been born again to worshiping their creator is freely able to love like their creator. But MacArthur's point is a valid one. When we say, I love you, we often say, I love me and I want you. He continues and says this. He tells the story of Alan Redpath of a young woman who came to her pastor desperate and despondent. She said this, there's a man who says he loves me so much he will kill himself if I don't marry him. What should I do? 
and the pastor says, do nothing. That man doesn't love you, he loves himself. Such a threat isn't love, it is pure selfishness. Now this guy's not really on the verge of suicide, is he? How often? Um, I, all through high school, I remember guys would say things like these, this to girls, right? Um, and they're, they're saying, <clears throat> the point is, they're saying, I'm, I'm going to be miserable if you don't complete me. And they're putting a pressure on the person of, you have to fulfill me. That's selfish, isn't it? That's not true love. What's that? Manipulation. Yeah, it's manipulative. <laughs> and so you're trying to coerce people to do what you want them to do to fulfill and satisfy your selfish ends. But that's so much of what our world defines as love. Um, I would die without you. Um, it's, a, it's really almost a selfish kind of love. Um, and I'm not saying, look, and we'll get into the real reality of love. I'm not saying there's not the aspect of phileo and eros and storge in love. These dimensions of love, of sexual attraction and, and brotherly affection and familial affection. I'm not saying that's not there. What I'm saying is, if you have all those loves, but you lack agape love, the love is ultimately going to fall short as a selfish form of love. And so Paul here isn't talking about phileo love, which is just the brotherly love. He's talking in 1 Corinthians 13 of agape love, a concept which is almost altogether absent in our day. Agape love, I write, is not the eros <clears throat> that the world thinks it is or the mere phileo be between friends. Phileo between friends. Agape love is the love God displayed in sending his son to die on the cross. It is the love of John 3.16. By this we know love. Oh no. 1 John 3.16, sorry. It is the love of John 3.16, isn't it? But it's also 1 John 3.16. By this we know love. That he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. That's love, right? 1 John 4.9. If you... <clears throat> this is helpful to have because <clears throat> I always go to 1 John 4, 9 through 12 to define love. What is love? 1 John 4, 9 to 12. In this is love. In this, I'm sorry, that's going to be verse 10. But in verse 9, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Verse 10, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. You want to know what love is? Propitiation is love. Jesus Christ absorbing the wrath of God on your behalf. Verse 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God's, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. So it's agape love. Agape love is self-sacrificial. That's demonstrated in the cross. What benefit was there for Christ in the cross? There was a lot of benefit in the sense of he gained for himself a people. He brought glory to God the Father. But Christ sacrificed himself. <coughs> Agape love is concerned with more, with more than just yourself. It's concerned actually with the other person more than yourself. <clears throat> Which is why only Christians are truly able to display agape love? You say, how? I mean, truly. Because what Christ does is in the gospel, he, you die to self and you're risen to life. That's what he says in 2 Corinthians 5. He died for us that we would no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died and was raised. So, it's concerned more with the other person than with yourself. That's agape love. That's Christian love. It is a decision, not a fuzzy feeling, right? That's why at seven years, people say they get the seven-year itch in marriage. That's why a lot of divorces statistically happen after seven years. Why is that? Well, it's pretty much about the time where you've just had it. And you're just, you know, bored of the person, no longer attracted to the person. And so... <clears throat> Time to move on. That's a feeling, right? When I was in high school, um, I thought about my future wife, you know, and I'm thinking about having a girlfriend or whatever. And I remember thinking, I was terrified to have a girlfriend 
because I thought um, one day they're just going to say, ah, I don't love you anymore. I'm like, and I was thinking, I remember thinking, how, like, because all your friends and everything, you're in high school, right? That's what happens. Yeah, I fell out of love. Just like that. It's like, wait, last week, this was the best thing ever. And now, just fell out of love. And I thought, this thing is so arbitrary. This thing could just happen to anybody, anytime. So I was scared of a relationship because what if they just fall in love? But that's not love, is it? That's a fuzzy feeling. That's a, wow, wow, I love you. Oh, okay, don't love you anymore. Wow, I love you. Oh, I don't love you anymore. Oh, wow, I love you. You don't satisfy me anymore. Yeah, exactly what's being said. You no longer satisfy me. I want something more. Something else does. Yeah. True love is displayed in self-sacrifice, and it's a decision. Where, yes, you look at your spouse, you look at your fellow church member, you look at your children, you look at your pastor, you look at the people in the church, you look at your relationships, and you say, you're not very lovable right now, but I'm going to love you, right? And that's the love God displayed toward us and displays toward us. Isn't it wonderful that you don't have to feel the pressure every day of waking up and impressing God to maintain his love? as a Christian, because you're saying, imagine that. You've got to perfectly perform every day in order for God to love you. So we love that from God, receiving agape love, but then we don't want to give that to our wife. So because she gained five pounds and didn't put makeup on today, I'm not going to give her the love. Because she's annoying me during the football game, I'm not going to display that love to her. Conditional, feeling-oriented love. But then we go to God and say, God, thank you for loving me with agape love. But then we don't display it toward others. Remember what John said? Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. He goes on before in 1 John, he says, if you don't love, you're not a Christian with this love. Because you've not experienced it. But if you've experienced it, it's in you and you will display it. So brothers, this love is the higher way. And I want us to notice, going back to 1 Corinthians 13, what Paul says is useless with Alnet. Think, think in equations here, okay? Let's look at verse uh, 1. Let's make an equation. This minus this equals this. If I speak in the tongues of men... And of angels, but have not love. So, tongues of men and angels minus love equals what? What does it say? Nothing. Yeah, well, it says it in a different term there. A noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. <laughs> yeah. Meaningless noise. Yeah. I said annoying, right? That's annoying. Just, ah, get out of my ear. Just some. A little kid. It's like when you have a drum set in your house and somebody comes over and says, hey, I can play the drums. And you just go, stop. <laughs> you can't play them. It's more than just hitting it with a stick. It's noise. It's annoying. Wow, you speak in the tongues of angels. Wow. But you have no love. That equals annoying. That's verse 2. If I have prophetic powers, understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, so you have powers plus understanding all mystery plus possessing all knowledge plus all faith minus love equals nothing. nothing. I am nothing. What about if you have, in verse 3, incredible generosity? Minus love equals? I gain nothing. You gain nothing. What if I die for the kingdom? Minus love. I'm a martyr equals? Yeah. It's pointless. Now, this may be monotonous to us because we've literally heard this at every wedding, right? If I give my body to be dirt burned, but I'm not love, I am nothing. It wouldn't have just been white noise for the Corinthians. Think of the context again, right? The man writing this would be killed. All of the men he walked with, from the majority, beheaded, crucified, murdered, sent off to um, Patmos, 
to live in isolation. This martyrdom was real, right? So I can stand up to tomorrow at church and say, if you give your body to be burned but have not love, it's nothing. And nobody in this room is facing the threat of burning. But Paul was. It wasn't hyperbole for him to say, if I deliver up my body to be burned. That was a very present and real danger. And it wouldn't be long after, maybe a couple of decades, where this was commonplace in Rome. Actually, probably more than a couple decades. But it commonplace in Rome for Christians to be burned. So, this is... Oh, I put a note here. Martyrdom without love is nothing. This would have been especially pertinent to Paul, wouldn't it? Given the fact that he was instrumental in the murder of the first martyr. These aren't light, pleasant trees that are coming out of Paul at a wedding, right? He's literally saying, you can be burned alive and it be pointless because you don't have love. It's pretty intense, isn't it? These would have been and were revolutionary and shocking words to the church. Now, I want us to pause, and I have an exercise here for you to do. I gave you a pen, and I gave you a little space under exercise. I want you to start about half an inch from the left of your paper, or just under where it says exercise. I want you to take 10 seconds here, write a row of zeros, and you're going to say, come on. But just write a row of zeros all the way across this page to the end of the page until you can't get hey, any more. You didn't say go. Go. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> go. Keep going. It's like Keep going. school. Do not open your tabs yet. <laughs> Page tickets. I almost can feel what is going on. It's not going anywhere. <laughs> It's going to be a lot more simple than you think. Well, there's, no, there's no consistency. So we've got, we've got zeros, right? Uh-huh. I'm going to ask you a very simple question. There's a lot of zeros. How many zeros, or, or what number does that add up to? Zero for zero. It's zero. Well, if you count the zeros, it'll add up. <laughs> you have two zeros? Or some of you probably have 25 or 30 zeros, right? And it all equals the same. That's what Paul's saying. Oh, I, I, I speak in tongues, and I'm a prophet, and I'm even on my way to be burned. But you don't have love? You're nothing. Now, each of you, in your mind, think of a number between 1 and 20. You have it? Mm-hmm. Write that number down in front of the zeros. Or in front. In front or in front? Behind <laughs> In front. We write from left to right, so in front. <laughs> now what does it add up to? <laughs> no, it doesn't. No. It adds up to an <laughs> un- like, innumerable oh. number. Fifth, one, five, zero, 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 oh. zero, 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 zero. It's inestimable in its value, right? There's no cap on that. You see that? So whether you thought one and put one in front of your zeros... You have hundreds of trillions there, right? What if you put 20? Now you've got an inestimable inestimable number. That's love. You take love and you put it before and in the gifts God gives to you and it's invaluable. You can't put a cap on the value of that. How you love the saints, how you serve the saints, how you worship God, the gifts you exercise. There's no value you can put on it. If you take love away, there's no value you can put on it for positive. It equals nothing. Does that make sense? The point is clear. Without love, it does not matter how gifted you are. With however many gifts you have, it all equates to nothing. But with love, there is no way to estimate the value of it. The tragedy of 
a lack of love is put on display for us in Scripture in the book of Revelation. Turn to Revelation chapter 2. So, speaking of the Ephesian church, we read this in Revelation 2.1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. That's Christ. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. Now, stop there. At this point, the Ephesian church is looking pretty good. Remember Paul's letter to Timothy? Timothy is the pastor at Ephesus. He exhorts him in those letters multiple times to be aware of false teachers and false doctrine, right? The church, under Timothy's guidance, seems to have taken that warning very seriously. Look, they're commended here very highly by Christ. He says, I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance. You can't bear with those who are evil. You've tested those who call themselves their apostles, and, and, and they're not, and you found them to be false. These guys were rigorous. They bore up for his name's sake. They haven't grown weary. Stroud writes these words here. He says, the Ephesians could have written a book on successful church ministry. However, all was not well. Something was fundamentally wrong with divine, I love this, with divine penetrating insight into the true spiritual state of this outwardly successful church, Jesus Christ turned from commendation to condemnation. We read these chilling words in verse four, but I have this against you that you have abandoned the love you had at first remember therefore from where you have fallen repent and do the works you did at first if not i will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent yet this you have you hate the works of the nicolaitans which i also hate he owes an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches to the one who conquers i will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of god what kind of love had they lost agape love We're not told the specifics. We're simply told. We're not told who it's directed toward. So we assume this is agape love in general toward God and toward man. They'd lost it. You've abandoned the love you have at first. Um, I I sent out to you guys on the WhatsApp group the audio version. Did you guys get that? The audio of this? A little exercise for young theologians. I want to read... A section from this, thirty-seven forty. It's it's chilling. I mean, it'll hit you between the eyes. This loss of love, and and here, this little book is is about the dangers of studying in seminary or studying theology. He promotes the study, but he says, okay, let's be wary of some dangers, right? And he talks about the young man who goes off to seminary, and he was a zealous youth group leader passionate, preaching from his heart what the Lord showed him in the word, goes off to seminary, comes back as this big-headed theologian. And he warns of this. Listen, Listen to this. The first year young theologian returns home, some symptoms of a real disease are appearing. It is possible, and laymen have a very exact perception in regard to this, that theology makes the young theologian vain and so kindles in him something like Gnostic pride. The Gnostics were all about higher learning. So whoever had a more new learning, they they boasted of. That's why John says, writing against the Gnostics in 1 John, whoever departs and moves on from Christ does not have God. Because they said, yeah, yeah, Christ, but we got to move on, higher learning. Anyway, listen to what he says. The chief reason for this, his pride, is that in us men, truth and love are seldom combined. It is also possible to say precisely why. Listen to this. Truth seduces us very easily into a kind of joy of possession. I have comprehended this and that, learned it, understood it. Knowledge is power. I am therefore more than the other man who does not know this and that. 
I have greater possibilities and also greater temptations. Anyone who deals with truth, as we theologians do, succumbs all too easily to the psychology of the possessor. But love is the opposite of the will to possess. It is self-giving. It boasteth not in itself, but humbleth itself. See what he said? The temptation to be a possessor with knowledge. But love is all about giving. Notice this. He goes on. Now, it is almost a devilish thing that even in the case of the theologian, the joy of possession can kill love. It is a devilish thing. It is devilish because the truth of theology is concerned with the very love of God, with his coming down, his search, his care for souls. So the theologian, and not least the young theologian, gets into a horrible internal conflict. He is studying Christology, which means that he's busying himself with the Savior of sinners and the brothers of the lost. In connection with Christology, he learns the Chalcedonian formula and the form history of the synoptics. And in possession of this truth, he despises, of course, in the most sublime way, the people who as simple Christians pray to this savior of sinners and cling to each of his, perhaps even legendary, miracles. You see? So he's studying the very one who came to be with sinners. And through his studying of them, he begins to despise those who do not have the knowledge he has. In his reflective detachment, the theologian feels himself superior to those who in their personal relationship to Christ completely pass over the problems of the historical Jesus or demythologizing or the objectivity of salvation. This disdain is a real spiritual disease. It lies in the conflict between truth and love. This conflict is precisely the disease of theologians. Like a child's disease, it is often especially acute even ordained pastors can still catch this disease without its power to do harm becoming diminished. You see what he's saying? This knowledge as possessing you can lead you to despise and not love because love is all about giving. And he gives an example here of a Christian dealing with a, a philosopher or a follower of a philosopher who denies Christ, right? And listen, in this dialogue, he goes on to tell the story, but then he says this. Of the Christian. His purpose in dialoguing with this unbeliever unquestionably was to crush the man by the impression of an overpowering irritation to which he could never attain and thus to reduce him to a feeling of helplessness by just throwing terminology and words and facts and scriptures at him that the man clearly didn't understand, but just to make the man feel helpless and crush him under a power, a wave of. of intellect nobody would maintain that this dubious pleasure of the student had even the least bit to do with Christian love for one's neighbor not even in a much demythologized form the purpose of his action was not to impart to the other man some understanding of what we theologians are driving at or to lead him gently beyond the stage of his previous knowledge but his point was to render him helpless this person who because of his previous education could not eat be equal to this literature set before him and to suffocate his perhaps very simple objections to the historical critical study of the Bible by throwing them over an overbearing and imposing blanket of arguments. And listen to this. This is the last point. Here, truth is employed as a means to personal triumph and at the same time as a means to kill, which is in the starkest possible contrast with love. Truth. The very communication of God's agape love used as a hammer to crush your opponent. It's the opposite of love, right? And that's the temptation of knowledge. And you look at the Ephesian church. Yeah, great doctrine. False teachers came in. They, eh, nope, you're false. Didn't have anything to do with them. They didn't budge. He says you were patient under, you bore down. They didn't budge. They didn't go with the times of the world, right? Well, they're ordaining homosexuals now. Oh, we got to do that. No, the Ephesian church said, no, we're standing on truth. But it was void of love. 
And so Jesus says, repent, or I will come and remove your lampstand. Whatever that means, that's intense, right? I don't want God to come to me as a man, come to this church as a body and say, yeah, good job. You held up theology in this, but I have something against you. Isn't that a terrifying word here? Brothers, so in the reverse, we are to lead with love. And I'm closing up here. Um, Alexander Strauch writes of Amy Carmichael, and I'm going to quote this tomorrow in my sermon. The British missionary to India. She served, she created an orphanage and a mission in India for 55 years without furlough. Didn't come off the field. 55 years. Listen to what she wrote when she outlined for her workers in her orphanage how they were to behave. Listen to this, it's beautiful. Unlove is deadly. It is a cancer. It may kill slowly, but it always kills in the end. Let us fear it. Fear to give room to it as we should fear to nurse a cobra. It is deadlier than any cobra. And just as one minute drop of the almost invisible cobra venom spreads swiftly all over the body of one into whom it has been injected, so one drop of the gall of unlove in my heart or yours, however unseen, has a terrible power of spreading all through our family. For we are one body. We are parts of one another. We owe it to the younger ones to teach them the truth that united prayer is impossible unless there be loyal love. If unloved be, if unloved be discovered anywhere, stop everything and put it right, if possible, at once. Isn't that good? It's a deadly venom and it'll kill. It will kill. So my question as I close here, how do we guard our love? as leaders so as not to fall into the sin of the Ephesians or to be loveless leaders? How do we do that? And I have several things. First, be wary of external religion. What is external religion? What do you think of there? It's um, falling into the traditions of, of a specific church. Yeah. And this, uh, the next one is be wary of ritual religion. So we'll deal with that maybe nuanced. My, my purpose for external religion was doing your works to be seen by men. That makes sense? So, so the Pharisees, right, praying at the, the corners of the, the streets. Oh, yeah. And he says, the, yeah. The, putting yourself in private. And yes, and he says, when you pray, go in private. Don't, your father sees, he'll reward you. They have their reward in full. External religion. It's all about a show out here. So you've missed in here, right? So you're doing it to impress. We Be wary of that. Yes, we guard our reputation. Yes, we, do, we live above reproach. You, but you should not be here what you are not at home. You should be the same person. You should think, as a man, throughout your life, Josiah stayed with me last night in the house. I, I need to think, okay, if Josiah comes, do I need to hide things in my house? Do I need to cancel my normal Friday night plans? Do I need to, you know, turn that off? Because Josiah's coming, he's from church. If you do, there's problems. You should be this, the religion out here is the religion in here for the Christian. So beware of it. And if you find yourself saying to your kids, you know, D -d -d we're going to church. You don't do that. At, but then, and this happens. Oh, this happens. It's so sad. It's why children look at their parents and say, hypocrite. Saturday night, dad's watching the ball game. Um, the kids are fighting. And one of the kids starts crying, comes up to dad. Daddy. And the dad says, whatever, just go talk to your mom. Right? Saturday night in the house. Sunday morning. Father's in the foyer talking. Two kids get in a squabble between the siblings. One cries, comes up to daddy. Daddy. He goes, oh, are you okay? Okay, let's deal with this. Let's go get the kids together and let's talk. And That's hypocritical, right? 
daddy's doing that. So the others go, what good parenting? You know what happens to the kid? As they start to come to and recognize, they go, dad's one thing at church, another thing at home. He's a hypocrite. That's external religion. It's without love. Be wary, secondly, of ritual religion. That's what Mingo said, just doing, going through the motions of religion. We can do this. I, I talked to Trevor Johnson, a missionary of Papua Indonesia, and he told me, I was telling him, I said, how do you wrestle with feeling guilty? Like, let's say you sleep in 30 minutes or whatever, and you miss part of your devotional time. And I said, how do you wrestle with that? I feel guilty if, because if I don't have this set a lot of time for devotions, and it's shorter for something... I can feel guilty. He goes through my day like, man. And he told me the story of a woman he knew who was a good Christian woman. And she would come home after work and she would set up her room and relax. She had candles and all this and it was just soothing and she would have her devotions every day. And it was the same pattern, same length. And you could look at that and go, wow, great religious devotion, right? She's disciplined. But what would happen if one of her kids came in the room while she was doing that? Get out of here! here. She'd snap. So you say, whatever that devotion was producing, it wasn't producing the fruit of the Holy Spirit, right? <laughs> what it was more than anything else was ritual. Mm. That was a good pattern for her to follow that gave her peace of mind. But it wasn't genuine devotion, right? Mm. We can easily fall into that. My ritual is to wake up at 6 and from 6 to this time do my devotion and then I'm set for the day. And if I don't do that, I'm cranky. You might be more about ritual, ritualistic pattern than you are about the actual devotion. Five minutes in the presence of God in prayer is better than two hours spent in ritual. Now, I'm not saying just spend five minutes. But is your religion heart religion or is it just ritual religion? This is just what we do on Sunday mornings, right? Um, but it's not true devotion. Were you going to say something? No, I was just thinking uh, being legalist, that's pretty much what, what it sounds like. Yeah, and it become, can become ritualistic legalism. Like you may never impose on others your ritual, but it's, it's just form for you mm -hmm. to do that. Okay, let's, let's, let's eat. Father, thank you for this food. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. All right. That was ritual. Genuinely give thanks. Lord, thank you for this food, Lord. Thank you for Josiah. He's able to be with us today, Lord. In the name of Christ, I pray, amen. You genuinely give thanks. Don't just run through the motions. So be wary of ritual religion. Be wary of blind religion, I say thirdly. And this is what I mean by this. Blind religion... Do you do any of you guys have blind spots? Yeah. What are they? If I knew they weren't blind anymore. Exactly. Do you have blind spots? Yes. What are they? I don't know. I'm blind to them. Be wary of blind religion. Ask for accountability from your wife, elders, brothers in the church. Ask them to reveal to you blind spots in your life and leadership. Wife, babe, please let me know if you see anything unchristlike in me, will you? Oh, no, she'll let me know. <laughs> Honey, I, am I leading you and our kids with the love of, of God that you see in the... Am I doing that? Honey, can you let me know? Hey, brother, can you please let me know if you ever hear anything in my tone of voice as I preach or to others that you, you don't think would be Christ-like. Can you please let me know that, brother? That's opening yourself up to have your blind spots revealed, right? You're saying, please show me my error. Please show me where I'm blind. Wouldn't the Ephesians have loved that? Don't you think? Before Jesus Christ had to come to them and say, but I have this against you. Wouldn't you think... They would have, in hindsight, Monday morning quarterbacking, 2020 hindsight, they would have gone, man, that would have been good if somebody had come and said, guys, I appreciate what you're doing here, but, right? I don't want to stand in judgment and hear that. I'd rather Michael, Domingo, I'd rather you come tell me and say, hey, brother, 
this is a pattern you're going down, which I don't think it's very loving. Thank you, right? We all have them. I just don't know what they are yet. So be wary of blind religion. Give yourself eyes, namely the eyes of others. Okay. Fourth, cultivate a healthy confessional introspection. And I just have Psalm 139, 23 to 24. Cultivate a healthy confessional introspection. Say a healthy introspection. You don't want to become a navel gazer. You know, navel gazer is you're just staring down at your navel all the time, just looking. Oh, am I in or am I? I'm going to No, we're looking to Christ. But there's a place for healthy introspection where we do examine ourselves, which leads our eyes back to Christ. Psalm 139 Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Okay? So pray confessionally. How often do you pray confessionally? If you don't, you need to be. And one of your prayers needs to be, Lord, help me to love with a godly love. Fifthly, or yeah, you must guard first and foremost. How, how do you avoid this loveless leadership? You must guard first and foremost your fellowship with Christ. Cultivate a devotional life that is the one thing necessary in your days. Men. Listen, listen to, uh, remember Martha and Mary? Martha was doing so much. And Jesus says, you've missed it. Mary's chosen the better portion. One thing is necessary. What was the one thing? Sit at the feet of Christ and learn of him. Cultivate a devotional life. That is your one thing necessary. It's not necessary, Michael, that you go to work on Monday. It's not. You say, but I'll get fired. Okay. You'd still live, right? You'd find a way to provide. Now, it's, your, it's necessary in one sense in that it's your God-given responsibility. But I mean, ultimately, one thing is necessary, Jesus says, sit at my feet and learn of me. Is your devotional walking with Christ in fellowship your one thing necessary? Or is that like number six that you get to at the end of a long day if you have time? That's not one thing necessary. Yeah. That's one of the things not really necessary. Listen to Francis Schaeffer. We must ask, do I fight merely for doctrinal faithfulness? This is like the wife who never sleeps with anybody else, but never shows love to her own husband. Is that a sufficient relationship in marriage? No. 10,000 times no. Yet if I am a Christian who speaks and acts for doctrinal faithfulness, but do not show love to my divine bridegroom, this is the church of Ephesus, I am in the same place as such a wife. What God wants from us is not only doctrinal faithfulness, but our love day by day. Not in theory, mind you, but in practice. Listen, listen to C.H. McIntosh. If I allow my work to get between my heart and the master, it will be little worth. We can only effectually serve Christ as we are enjoying Christ. It is while the heart dwells upon his powerful attractions that the hands perform the most acceptable service to him. True, he, speaking of a man, may preach a sermon, deliver a lecture, utter prayers, write a book, and go through the entire routine of outward service, and yet not minister Christ. The man who will present Christ to others, now listen to this, must be occupied with Christ himself. I love that. So our leadership must be loving, agape love leadership that if lacking, it doesn't matter what you do, it's pointless. You can follow all the principles, you know, of raising your kids, being a good husband. So he says, Schaefer says, oh, you being, you're being faithful to your wife because you don't sleep with someone else? Great. Is that love? No. Not if you don't show her any affection. Well, I didn't sleep with you again today, honey. Be happy. I mean, I didn't sleep with, you know, didn't cheat on you today, honey. Be happy. Oh, thanks. Great. I feel so loved. And you're like a cold wall. We've got to love with agape love. And to do that, we've got to cultivate and keep the fires of affection burning in our souls for the Lord.